So good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study uh, here at Kern Heights Baptist Church. We had a great day this past Sunday. I think we had 96, which if you'd have told me back in January you're going to have 96 in attendance in August, I probably would have gone into mourning because we had a lot more attending at that time. But with the COVID-19 virus and everything that's going on, uh, I was really happy with 96. And I know there were some folks that were in the Rainbow Room watching it through our GoPro camera. And we also had some people out in the fellowship hall. So we'd just like to encourage everybody uh, to, uh, you know, if, if you'd like to come, uh, we'll do everything we can to make it as safe for you as possible. We do have some options. Uh, of course, the live stream thing is still going on. And uh, anyway, we just want to do everything we can so that your worship experience with us at Kern Heights is a good one. So I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to talk uh, the, this evening about overcoming or dealing with temptations from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 11, 12, and 13 in just a moment. Let's pray. Lord, help me as I go through this tonight. Lord, I thank you for uh, the encouragement that I hear from time to time about people who are not even really connected with our church, but who are watching on, by way of Facebook. And so, Lord, I ask you to continue to help us to reach people that way. And, Lord, I pray that you will continue to uh, protect our people from the virus. And Lord, we're grateful for the souls that were saved, the professions of faith and commitments that were made at the Awakening Conference. And I just ask your help as we try to follow up on those people. And I pray that, Lord, you'd put them in good, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches. Churches, Lord, where they'll be loved and where they will uh, learn your word and, and just grow to love Jesus. So we do thank you for uh, the awakening and, Lord, for the way that you used uh, Jeremy Freeman and Caleb, especially on Saturday night when they were sharing their testimony. So, Lord, be with me and help me as I try to lead Kern Heights. And, Lord, give us wisdom as we try to navigate these difficult times and let this lesson lesson be a help, Lord, to people who are struggling with temptation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. I'm going to read uh, verse 11, 12, and 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we talk tonight about dealing with temptation. So it says in verse 11, These things happened to them, the Israelites, uh, in the Old Testament, as examples, and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you're thinking you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So these verses give us some strategies for dealing with temptation. We're going to go into those as we work our way through the lesson. Now, last week we talked about learning from examples because earlier in this chapter, in chapter 10, in verse 6, and also in the verse we just read, verse 11, it says, these things occurred as examples. Verse 11, we read a moment ago, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. So God really is saying, don't make the same mistakes these people did. I told you last week, these stories are really interesting and really, you know, cool stories uh, from the Old Testament. But they're more than that. They're examples for us so that we don't repeat the same kind of behavior. Uh, just kind of reviewing for a moment, what, you know, what mistakes did they make? Well, if you read verses 6, 7, uh, 8, 9, and 10, you'll find that they, they slipped into idolatry. Uh, they fell into sexual immorality. There was grumbling, complaining, all kinds of things like that. So God says, you know, whether it's idolatry, immorality, complaining, or, you know, it could be any number of other sins and things that we're tempted to do. He says, don't fall like they fell. So our question for tonight is this, how do we overcome temptation and how? It's one thing to say, don't do it. It's another thing to say, you know, here's how you keep from doing it. So how do we avoid falling into sin like the Israelites fell into? And I'm going to give you two or three things from our verses tonight that we've read. And the first thing is this. Realize, first of all, that you are not immune to temptation. Another way of saying it would be, you know, don't be prideful or overconfident. Now that's in verse 12. It says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 
Don't be cocky. Don't be overconfident. Don't have the attitude that says, well, you know, so-and-so may fall into that sin, but I'm kind of at a higher level spiritually. And so what affects him or what affects her, that's not going to affect me. I'm, I'm pretty much immune to it. If you're thinking something like that, if you're thinking, you know, this would never happen to me, I'd never do that, you've just taken the first step toward falling into sin. In fact, I would argue that you're already guilty of pride. The Bible teaches that God hates pride. So the Bible is filled with examples all over the place, example after example of people who are overconfident and, you know, how it costs them. In the Old Testament, uh, a good example of this is in the book of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 6, we read about a great victory where Joshua and the Israelites, uh, you know, defeated the people of Jericho. If you know your Bible, you're probably familiar with the story. They marched around Jericho, you know, one time each day, and then on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, and the priest blew the trumpets, and when they did that, the walls fell down flat. And the Israelites went in, and they had a great victory. Well, in chapter 7, we read something completely different. There's a little town called Ai, much, much smaller, probably just a village, smaller town called Ai. And so Joshua, you know, and the people, they say, look, you know, this isn't worth fooling with. Uh, you, the, we don't need to send the whole army. I mean, it's going to be an easy victory. We'll just send a few of the folks, and they should be able to take care of everything. They didn't pray about it. They didn't consult God. And there's a lot to the story. But when you read that story, you'll find that they suffered a crushing defeat at Ai. Part of the reason, not the only reason, but part of the reason was they were overconfident, and as a result of that, they forgot to consult God. Um, in the New Testament, I guess the classic example of overconfidence is Simon Peter when, you know, he told the Lord Jesus, everybody else will deny you. Um, you know, all the other disciples, these guys, they're not quite as committed. They don't love you as much as I do. They may deny you, but Lord, I'll die before I'll deny you. Of course, Peter, again, he, he too suffered a crushing defeat. So overconfidence is something that as a believer, you always want to stay away from. So that kind of brings up a question. Why is overconfidence so deadly? And I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one is overconfidence will cause you to focus on you and your strength. You on your own are no match for sin. You on your own are no match for the world. You on your own are no match for the devil. So anytime you're trying to live the Christian life, you know, in your own strength, that's a recipe for disaster. And overconfidence, um, it's usually there because it's all about you or about me and, you know, how strong we are. So that's the first reason. The second reason is overconfidence is prideful and God hates pride. Now, he doesn't hate you if you're prideful, but he does hate the pride that's in your heart if you've got that. And a great verse on that is James 4, 6, where it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, grace is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Obviously, you know, the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved. Salvation, we can't save ourselves. And so it's the grace of God through Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross when he gave his life for us, he paid for our sins with his blood, he rose again, and if we'll just ask him, he'll be our substitute, all right? That's how the grace of God applies to salvation. But the grace of God doesn't end with salvation. The grace of God is there for everyday living because I need God's help to live the Christian life just like you do. So go back to our verse for a moment. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, if, if I'm prideful, if you're prideful, and the Lord helps us to overcome temptation, all he's done is encourage pridefulness. All he's done is encourage us, you know, to be all about us and arrogant and cocky and all that kind of stuff. So God doesn't want to do that. Uh, he's doing more than just helping people overcome temptation. He also wants us to have our hearts humble before him. So while he resists the prideful, if you're humble, he gives you grace. In other words, he does for you what you cannot do for your own, he, on your own. He'll defeat temptation for you. He'll help you defeat a temptation that on your own you can't defeat. But for that to happen, you've got to be humble because God loves humility. And he'll give help. He'll give grace to those that are humble 
but he's like this when it comes to pride. So the first thing on our list tonight, and it's really important, it's kind of a foundational thing, is if you want to overcome as far as temptation is concerned and you want to have victory, then it starts out by being humble and not arrogant. So realize that you're not immune to temptation and that you don't need to be prideful or overconfident. And again, just thinking, you know, hey, this doesn't apply to me because I'm, I'm, I'm too spiritually advanced. No, you're not. Second thing. Uh, the second thing, and the, the rest of this is going to be actually from verse 13, which I want to read again. Verse 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So here's the second thing I want you to see about overcoming temptation. Number two, believe, you need to believe and put into practice what God says about temptation. That's just acting in faith or living by faith because faith is just, you know, believing what God says enough that you're willing to put it into practice. You're willing to act upon it. So when God says something about any subject for our purposes tonight, when God says what he says about temptation in verse 13, we read that, we hear that, we believe that, and then we have to act on it because faith without works is dead, um, according to the book of James chapter 2. So you put it into practice. You believe it and you put it into practice. So what does God say about temptation that we're going to learn tonight so that we can put it into practice? Okay, let's break it down. He says in the first part of verse 13, your temptations aren't extraordinary. They are just like everyone else's. See, we have a tendency to think that I'm a special case or, you know, I'm different than everybody else, but that's not what God says. And you and I have to choose to believe what God says and not what we think or what we feel or what somebody else, you know, tells us or what the devil would have us believe. And in the first part of verse 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Like Adrian Rogers used to say, everybody has the same garden variety temptations. Uh, the specifics may differ, but, you know, yours isn't out there. It, you're not in a class by yourself. Everybody has the same temptations. Now, Satan will try to get you to believe otherwise. He'll try to get you to believe that you're a special case. And let's just use the example of sexual immorality. Uh, the people at Corinth had a real problem with that. That's why you, you know, you see it you know, coming up again and again and again as we work our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. The same thing is true in our culture today. We live in a, a sex-saturated culture that is full of sexual immorality. So here's what the devil will try to get you to believe if, you're, if and when you're tempted by sexual immorality. You know, he'll tell you something like this. You're lonely, and God understands that. God knows you're only human. Or, you know, you're both senior adults and, hey, you know, you're too old to get pregnant and nobody's going to get hurt. You don't have to worry about, you know, breaking up a family or anything like that. So, you know, it's just different. It's not like, you know, if, if we were teenagers or something like that. Maybe he'd get you to believe something like this. You know, your desires are stronger than most people. And so, you know, you're, everybody doesn't have to deal with that the way you do. And so because your desires are stronger, you just got to act on those, on those desires. So he will feed you information like that, which, of course, the information being lies. Here's what God says. God says your temptations are no different than anyone else's. And the Word of God applies to you just like everybody else. So you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to want it. You've got to want to believe the truth, and you've got to believe that you're not a special case and that whatever God has put in His Word and whatever help the Holy Spirit wants to give you, it applies to you just like it applies to everybody else. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and verse 5 tell us this. It says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So when some of those arguments, like I just mentioned, you know, you know, 
you're lonely and God understands that. We're, you know, we're both adults and we're consenting adults and, you know, nobody's going to get pregnant. When stuff like that kind of, you know, starts to go through your mind, you have to take that thought captive. And what that means is you make a deliberate choice, an intentional choice, not to dwell on that, but instead to replace that with what God says in His Word. So that's what it means when it says we demolish arguments and we take... Um, uh, every thought captive. So anyway, remember that. So that's the first part of this. Your temptations aren't extraordinary. They're just like everyone else's. Uh, verse 13 then moves a little bit forward and God tells us that he wants you to overcome. So because of that, he'll give you the strength to overcome. And that's in the middle part of verse 13. It says, God is faithful. Now that's really important because when we're struggling with temptation, one of the things that probably will go through your mind is, why isn't God helping me? Why am I not getting more strength, you know, or and I'm not getting strength the way that I want it or the way that I feel that I need it? Or, you know, maybe God's helping out somebody else in the church or somebody else in the community and He's not helping me out. And so we need to be reminded that God is faithful because temptation can be, it can be rough. And you can feel like you're all by yourself and you never, you know, you're never going to you know, have victory over this. And so you start to kind of get isolated in your mind and you think it's me alone, all by myself against sin. And that's not true. God is always with you. And in a healthy church, believers will be with you as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that in just a moment. But the scripture reminds us God is faithful. And it says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So that's where a lot of people, you know, I've heard so many people in ministry have asked me, you know, you know, Brother Bobby or Pastor Bobby, where, where does it say in the Bible that God will not put more on you than you can stand? Well, those exact words aren't in the Bible. But that phrase, God will not put more on you than you can stand, that actually comes from what I just read. God is faithful who will not permit you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape. So I guess another way of putting that would be that, you know, God's not going to put more on you or allow more to happen to you uh, than you can stand or that you can deal with. Now, that's what it says. God is faithful, and he'll not permit you to be tempted above what you're able. Let me tell you what it does not say. It does not say it's going to be easy. It just doesn't say that. I had, I had some good coaches growing up playing a lot of baseball and uh, a good coach in American Legion and, and a really good coach in high school. And some of those coaches would drive me crazy. Looking back, they're good coaches. But at the time, I thought, they're being unreasonable. Because I would look at how many laps we would run versus the amount of laps I knew other teams were running. We'd run a lot more. And I'm thinking, why are we running 20 or 25 laps around the baseball field every day, and these other guys aren't doing that? Or why are we practicing X number of times a week and the other guys don't have to do that? Or why are we doing all these other things that, you know, when uh, in, in, in before the games, uh, some of the coaches, you take what they call the infield. And it's where they kind of, you know, let you take a few ground balls and just to kind of get you warmed up and get you ready for the game. Some of the coaches would hit little love taps and the other team looked really good, you know, because it's easy to catch a love tap. Man, our coach, he hit what we call short hops, and those are line drives that land about 10 feet in front of you, and you never know whether the ball is gonna stay down or come up. And so they want you to stay down, but it seemed like every time I'd stay down, the ball would come up and you know miss me like that, and I, I'm scared within an inch of my life. My point in telling you that is that a good coach is a demanding coach, and not an unfair coach, but a demanding coach. And there were plenty of times where I, it felt like he was being un, these coaches were being unfair, but they were just doing what needed to be done for our team to be the best that we could be. And God's that way. He's a lot of things. He's a loving father. He's your savior. But he can be a demanding coach to where he puts you through paces that you don't think you can handle, except you can handle it. So this verse says that God is faithful, and he'll not permit you to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but it does not say what you think you can bear, and it does not say, you know, it's going to be easy. Um, and a lot of times we think we can't do something when we can. 
And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And on your own, you won't be able to do it, but with God's help, you can do it. Uh, we just, a, good, a dear friend of mine that I grew up playing ball with uh, passed away uh, just a couple, two or three days ago. And uh, Deborah and I, uh, tomorrow night, are going to be going. We're actually taping this earlier in the week, but anyway, so tomorrow night won't be Thursday night. But we, we're going to go to the visitation. And they're about our age, and she and I were talking this morning, drinking coffee on the porch, and, and you know, what his widow is going to be going through and how that the Lord will sustain her, but how that that's something that when we both think about it, you know, dread just can kind of come into your mind thinking, you know, Lord, please don't let something like that happen to me. It's not something that anybody wants to happen, but when those kinds of things happen, even though we don't think we can make it with God's grace, you can make it through things like that. At the Awakening Conference, uh, Pastor Jeremy Freeman and his son Caleb gave their testimony and how that Caleb was in uh, just a tragic automobile accident and looked like he wouldn't survive and looked like he would never walk and looked like he would never function. And God has done a really miraculous work in his life, but it's still really tough what they're going through. Again, the kind of things that, you know, you, you wouldn't wish that on anybody. But one of the things that Caleb said on Saturday night at the conference, because I wouldn't repeat this unless he had said it publicly, but apparently he was kind of away from the Lord before the accident, and he, he said if he had it to do over, he would rather be where he is now with the accident than where he was before the accident. So just remember those kinds of things that, you know, God is not going to let you be tempted above what you're able to bear. But that doesn't mean it'll be easy, and that doesn't mean that uh, you, you may or may not think you can bear it. But with God's help, you'll be able to bear it, and the Lord wants to give you victory. Uh, now, the key in all that, and, I, and I'll move on, is that you're not bearing it all alone. You're right. On your own, you won't be able to bear it. But with God's help, you can bear it. So how does God help us? Sometimes He helps us directly. Uh, the Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he prayed to the Lord three times for God to remove it. And God said, basically, I'm not going to remove it. But instead, I'm going to give you my grace to help you live with it and to help you deal with it. And the famous phrase that a lot of people who are students of the Bible know is, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so what he was telling Paul is the same thing he's telling us, that, you know, when we're weak and we realize we can't do it on our own, that's when the Lord's strength really comes through and really helps us. So sometimes God will give us that strength directly, but sometimes he'll give it through other believers. And that's where verses like Galatians 6-2 come in, where it says, bear one another's burdens, in doing so you fulfill the law of Christ. So one way that you, know, you can give me strength or one way that I could give you strength or we can give each other strength is by helping bear those burdens. Uh, I want to be real specific here. When it comes to temptation, one of the failings of the church is that somehow we have never created an environment to where people feel comfortable, you know, asking each other for help when it comes to dealing with temptation. Uh, that's one of my dreams and one of my goals for Kern Heights Baptist Church is that we'll get to a point to where, you know, instead of putting on our church mask and pretending everything's okay, that we'll love each other and have relationships that are deep enough so that when we find ourselves in trouble, uh, we can call each other and say, hey, can you pray for me? Or can you, you know, I, I, can you come help me? I'm, I'm, I'm about to get myself in trouble and I need some help here. Again, going back to James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. When you ask another believer to help you with a specific temptation, that's humbling yourself. And God is going to step in and then provide that grace, that help that you need when you do something like that. So that's the second thing. You need to believe and put into practice what God says about temptation. And the third and final thing we get from these verses is this, that temptation is powerful. So finding a way out is part of God's plan. Now God can deliver you and God will deliver you. But with that said, I don't want you to think that temptation is not a powerful force because it is. It's very powerful. So finding a way out is part of God's plan. That's in the last part of verse 13. It says, when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And in your Bible, uh, some translations say uh, he will also make a way of escape. 
And so underline escape or underline a way out. Because the idea is that you don't want to stay there and subject yourself to the same temptation several times because every time you subject yourself to it, the chances of you giving in increase. I guess in plain English what I'm saying is running is a good strategy. Think of the example of Joseph in the Old Testament. He was tempted by uh, Mrs. Potiphar, probably an older woman. Uh, and so, you know, he was young. The Bible says he was well-built and handsome, you know, uh, late teens, most likely. Uh, and so here he's a younger guy, you know, she's a cougar, and so she's after him. And so she, she was not going to take no for an answer. And so there came a point to where she, she actually literally physically grabbed Joseph, and he literally ran out of the house. So running sometimes means you run away literally like Joseph, but at other times it means that you choose not to put yourself into situations where you're going to be vulnerable because one of the key strategies for overcoming temptation is this thing called escape, finding a way out. So that sounds cowardly, but it's not. Any general or military you know, strategist knows that there are times you stay and fight, and then there are times that you realize that the enemy has the advantage, and so you retreat, not to never fight again, but you retreat so that you can regroup and fight on another day, at another time, when you have the advantage. And so that's the idea of running. And you see that in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, several times. The Scripture says in the book of 2 Timothy that we're to flee youthful lust, and that's not just you know sexual lust, uh, that's anything that you know can take can take over anything that be, can become an idol in our lives. Uh, in First Corinthians chapter six, it specifically says, "Flee sexual immorality." So, the idea or the strategy of running is certainly a biblical strategy. What's that going to look like? It may look different for different people. Let me just give you some ideas of how it might look. Um, you know, um, I've. With COVID-19, I've not been able to go to the jail, you know, in months, but I remember going to the jail and ministering to the inmates here in Sevier County, and one thing that they kept saying over and over is that, you know, inside, they're going to church, they're getting ministered to, they're kind of in a protected environment, but when they go outside, that's when it's so hard because a lot of times they come from broken families, they don't have a circle of stable friends, they might attend a church, but there's a big difference between being connected to a church and just coming to a church occasionally or, you know, maybe on Sunday morning. And so it's very easy for them to lapse back into that old lifestyle, especially when they got lonely and they didn't have any friends. And so they'd go back to their old friends a lot of times. And uh, one thing led to another. And first thing you know, they're back in the same old, you know, destructive, sinful patterns. So. For someone like that, running might mean moving to another community, uh, doing whatever it takes to get connected to a church or a group like uh, Celebrate Recovery, where you've got a support group there where they can help you and where they're going to come alongside you and walk you through those steps outside, uh, you know, jail, where you've got to reestablish yourself in society. Um, if, if gossip is, if you love to listen to gossip or if you like to participate, uh, I would say, you know, be real careful with social media. There's lots and lots of gossip on social media. And there's some good things on social media too, but a lot of gossip. So if you're inclined that way, you're not going to have a hard time filling that desire. So, you know, running or fleeing, escaping may mean that you just say, I'm going to be off social media, maybe for a while or maybe permanently. Um, things like pornography, you know, you, you, you make sure there are people who will hold you accountable. Make sure that, you know, uh, there are passwords that you don't have the password to. Or if there's a password uh, that you have access to that somebody else has it and they can check it any time. Uh, so it could be anything. It could be gambling. It could be, you know, any number of things. But make sure you know, part of running is not just running when you're tempted but running before you're tempted so that you don't put yourself into those kinds of situations 
So I'm going to read verse 12 and 13 again, and uh, then we'll close out today's study, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. It says, So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, He'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath it. So I hope and pray this blesses you. Uh, if you're struggling with a particular temptation or just temptation in general and you need somebody to pray with you, feel free to call the church. Uh, our number is 870-584-4361. Uh, uh, you can email me, bfisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, uh, 4309 at gmail.com, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So let's pray, and then we're going to be dismissed. Lord, thank you for uh, these words, and thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and that we can have victory in temptation. So, Lord, help us all to uh, live victorious lives and, Lord, uh, to put into practice these things that we've learned tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.